we're asking everybody to, oh yes, it's being recorded. Um, we ask everybody to please uh, rename yourself with your institution. It's just kind of fun to see where everybody is from. Uh, Shelby and I are from University of Miami, but yeah, so we'll give everybody a second to go ahead and do that. And we're really excited to have you. Thank you, Emily. So we're just gonna go really quick. Um, so quick who we are for any of the new faces that are here today. My name is Shilpi. I'm a second year medical student at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Why I feel like I have any right to be doing this, I'm on the executive boards for our emergency medicine and wilderness medicine interest groups. And then I'm also on the executive board for women in aerospace medicine, which is a subsection of the aerospace medicine student and resident organization. I have a great team of people helping me with logistics. Emily is here today um, helping me out. So you can say hi. Um, so for those of you that have come to my talks before, you've heard me say this before, but I'm just gonna keep rehashing it. Um, so why did I go through the trouble of bringing all of you guys here? Obviously my primary motivation is to expose interested students to the breadth of what wilderness and emergency medicine can be. You know, wilderness medicine is such a diverse and rapidly evolving field. And I wanted to create an opportunity where students are able to learn about these fields that are well beyond the constraints of the environments in which our schools are surrounded by. But on a deeper level, I kind of hope that whether you're interested in emergency and wilderness or not, I hope this speaker series is able to showcase the diverse spheres in which we as physicians can make an impact and kind of inspire you guys to start thinking abstractly about the ways in which we can use our future careers in medicine. Um, I know we've been stuck behind screens and walls for what feels like forever now with this pandemic. And so I hope this series is kind of a reminder to you guys that there's still so much out there and that we aren't confined to the walls of our hospitals. Um, so with that being said, it is my pleasure Oh, quick, just a what to expect today is ultra endurance medicine, which is super exciting. Uh, as you can see, we have tons of talks for the rest of the year. We have a talk pretty much every week until the end of the school year. So tons of opportunity to engage with all these exciting topics. Um, we'll throw it's the link to our website into the chat box for any of you that are interested or haven't seen it. But as you can see, please come to our talks, tend to get involved with. So that being said, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Martin Hoffman is Professor of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the University of California, Davis. He retired from his position as Chief of Physical Medicine and Rehab at the VA Northern California Healthcare System in May 2020, after over 35 years of service to the VA. He is the founder of Ultra Endurance Sports Science and Medicine, which is a nonprofit organization focused on the enhancement and distribution of scientific and medical knowledge related to participation in ultra endurance activities. He earned a BS in chemical engineering from the University of Missouri Rolla in 1978, an MD from St. Louis University in 1983, and completed his residency training in physical medicine and rehab at the Medical College of Wisconsin in 1986. He has published over 150 original scientific papers, mostly related to applied exercise physiology with focus on human locomotion, human performance, and proper hydration during prolonged exercise. He is a fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine and serves on multiple editorial boards. He's been a competitive cross-country skier or distance runner for most of his life and still enjoys exploring his own limits, though at a much slower pace than in the past. So with that, please join me in silent virtual claps to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Marty Hoffman. Hi, everyone. Let's, uh, there, I can see, I can see you now. Uh, hopefully you can see and hear me and uh, see the screen here. Uh, with my first slide is, can I get a thumbs up that? So go ahead and hit Alt S again so you can start sharing your screen. Uh. Okay, what about that? All Perfect. right, we've got sound, we've got video. All right, hi, hi again, everyone. I now I can't uh, can't see all of you, but I can see some of you. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, we'll be speaking about exercise-associated hyponatremia, and then at the end, I will uh, uh, give you a little. Uh, information about my background and my pathway um, 
of getting into and overlapping with wilderness medicine. Um, so nice. The, I can't seem to get the slides to move now. <laughs> There. All right, so here's the overview. So uh, with regard to the edu educational component of the lecture, we'll talk about the definition of exercise associated hyponatremia, the historical background, incidents, pathophysiology, how we make the diagnosis, uh, the treatment, uh, why athletes end up having this problem, how we prevent it, and uh, then I'll talk a little bit about my pathway into uh, overlapping with wilderness medicine, and uh, we'll have time for questions. And as far as I'm concerned, if, if you have a, a pressing question as we're going through this, feel free to interrupt. So we're gonna start with a video, and hopefully this will work. Uh, I'll set this up. The, um, Setting is the uh, 2016 Western States Endurance Run. This is a 100 mile running race through the Sierra Nevada mountains, uh, basically from the edge of Lake Tahoe westward to uh, a town called Auburn. And the finish is on the track. And so we're uh, at the finish waiting for the first runner to arrive. So I, if you can see my pointer, I'm pointing at, at the runner. And you can see that he's not moving very well. By the way, this is his mother. All right. Um, so some of you may may think that that would be the normal way you should look when you finish running a hundred mile race. Um, but that's not the case. In fact, the, the winners typically look very fresh because they're so excited about winning the race. And um, so if you see someone that looks like that, that they're collapsing while they're trying to run, that's a big red flag. You should be very concerned that there's some, something serious going on with that individual. That is very different than the situation when someone has been exercising, they suddenly stop and they collapse uh, within a minute or two after stopping. That is usually pretty benign and it's uh, an issue of postural hypotension. But when you see something like this, it's potentially serious. And in this case, it was due to exercise associated hyponatremia. So that's what we'll be talking about here. Um, this condition occurs uh, during or up to 24 hours after physical activity when the blood sodium level is below normal. Typically, laboratory normal values are between 135 and 145. So below 135 millimoles per liter is considered hyponatremia. And if it occurs uh, during or uh, within 24 hours of exercise, then we consider it exercise 
associated hyponatremia. Uh, it's not a new thing at all. You can see some, some um, uh, history here in terms of who first um, reported on the condition. Uh, if, if you're a, a runner, you might recognize the name Tim Noakes. He, he was the first to, to actually report on this. And then there, shortly thereafter, there was a case at, at the Western States Endurance Run that was reported in a, another lay uh, journal. And then there, uh, beyond that, we began to see some scientific papers. This paper from 1986, I'll touch on a little later, uh, actually published in JAMA. So um, some of this goes back pretty far in terms of uh, some good solid information about this condition. Uh, it's important because you might not only mess up your race, but you might die from this. And there have indeed been deaths related to various activities that I've, I've shown here. Uh, I'll highlight a few of these. In um, 2014, there were actually two high school football players that died within a month of each other related to exercise associated hyponatremia. Both of their, them were in environments uh, in the um, uh, southeast part of the United States where there was a lot of concern about dehydration. And so the, the environment was that, that you drink, 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 and drink to excess, in fact. And so that was uh, the reason these high school football players ended up developing hyponatremia and dying. Uh, and it's clear that it was not understood, certainly among the treating clinicians. This is a quote from the um, treating clinician at, at a, an academic institution. Um, and if you look at this, he basically says that it couldn't have been prevented or avoided. And uh, that's certainly not the case at, at all. Uh, here's another example. This is from the um, 2015 Ironman Europe Championships, uh, where there was a case of um, a hyponatremia resulting in death. And uh, a quote from the, the uh, race director is here. Um, he, he was quoted in this article saying that the condition was likely due to lack of salt intake and uh, the athlete mostly drank regular water during the race and did not take in enough minerals. Uh, again, evidence that there's significant lack of understanding of this condition. And hopefully by the time we're done, you'll um, have a better understanding yourself. Uh, since we're talking about uh, wilderness medicine, uh, here's another example. This was a Boy Scout on a, a long hike who ended up dying. And uh, the, the initial thought was that it was from heat stroke. And that's not a, at all unusual that there's a thought that the problem is dehydration or heat injury. And so fluids are pushed even more aggressively, which actually just makes matters worse. Uh, I have been asked to review the records on this case, and it's pretty clear that it was actually a case of hyponatremia. Uh, so these various deaths and, and lack of understanding uh, led uh, the organization of an international uh, consensus group. And we, we put out this comment, um, the evidence is firm that every single death from exercise-associated hyponatremia is avoidable if athletes adhere to rational hydration strategies and avoid excessive and unneeded fluid intake. And I would take it one step further and say that even if they do develop exercise-associated hyponatremia, it's actually very treatable if recognized and treated appropriately um, and, and rapidly. 
So if you're looking for a single source to, to read on this topic uh, and, and to get a little more background, this is the paper I'd recommend starting with at least. So this is the most recent consensus statement on EAH. And it, by the way, it's available free. It was published uh, in both the Clinical Journal of Sports Medicine and the British Journal of Sports Medicine. Both, both sources have made it free. Um, so let's talk about the incidence of this condition. Um, you can see some numbers there. The first study we did in 2018 um, was at a uh, 100 mile ultra marathon. And um, that along with one other study is where this 51% came from. So we, I can tell you, we, we were quite concerned uh, in 20, um, uh, or 2008 when we did that study and found that 51% of the study participants were hyponatremic at the end of the race. Uh, and this is what we've seen with regard to the change in incidence over time. So this is that, that first study we did. And then we did various studies over the course of a number of years. And, and you can see that there, there's been a, a, a drop down to around 6% uh, or so at um, the 100 mile races that we've done our, our research at. And we, we'd like to think that a lot of this has um, been due to our educational efforts, both in terms of educating athletes, educating the volunteers at races, um, and um, educating uh, others like crew members and uh, pacers who, who often influence uh, what, what the athletes are doing during, during these races. Um, we've also had some work uh, with Grand Canyon National Park uh, where they have had uh, a serious issue with exercise associated hyponatremia dating back uh, at least to 2009. Uh, prior to that time, um, they, were, they had signage and they made a big effort to make sure that people weren't getting dehydrated when going into the canyon. And that effort was actually too aggressive and led people to overhydrate and develop um, hyponatremia fairly, fairly commonly. And you can imagine in Grand Canyon, um, the cost and the risk associated with dealing with one of these cases. Um, you're, you're talking about um, sending uh, people uh, into the canyon on foot uh, and or using helicopter rescues. And it's not only expensive, but, but quite dangerous. So this was a, a, a big deal. Um, and with uh, some of our efforts with, in conjunction with the Grand Canyon, uh, there been some progress made in this regard. Um, this is a, a case report that we published several years ago uh, that, that came from the Grand Canyon. This was a situation of a husband and wife who were hiking in the canyon and the woman uh, started developing some central nervous system um, changes. And um, the husband got out his pocket medical guide and uh, it told him, well, she's probably dehydrated. And so he forced fluids and he continued to force fluids and she didn't get better. Uh, he even uh, thought that she might be over, um, overheated and uh, found a stream where he could drag her and have her partially submerged to cool her. None of this um, helped. And he eventually went for help. Uh, it was found that she had hyponatremia and she, she survived. But the point we were making with publishing this case report was that the information was just not there in this pocket medical guide. And there was no reason it shouldn't be. And um, 
In fact, the, the author of the guide was um, quite a prominent wilderness medicine person. And he, um, uh, I actually tried to reach out to him before we published this, but he wouldn't communicate with me. And so this, as it turns out, this was our way to, to um, make, uh, make him pay some attention to this issue. And my understanding is the textbook has now been corrected. Uh, and so this is one of our statements. We hope that by alerting your readers to this near fatal episode, authors and publishers of wilderness medicine books and organizers of conferences on wilderness medicine will be more attentive to including information on EAH so that we will never hear of another case that comes so close to avoidable catastrophe. Um, and I mentioned uh, the signage. This is actually from Yosemite, but this is similar to some of the signage that uh, was up at Grand Canyon National Park. And uh, I was alerted to this. I don't, I don't remember exactly what date, but this, this wasn't that many years ago. And so it took a few emails uh, to the medical director and hopefully this has been adjusted now. So what's, what's the pathophysiology on this condition? Well, um, here we've got the, the normal lung and brain on, on the right side of the screen and uh, what we see with uh, exercise associated hyponatremia. So there's pulmonary edema and there's brain swelling. And that's because uh, when the um, sodium concentration in the bloodstream is low, it allows the water to diffuse across the cell membranes into the cells, causing brain swelling uh, and lung swelling. In, in our um, environment, we've, we've typically seen the central nervous system type symptoms. Uh, and we haven't necessarily seen the respiratory symptoms, but others have, have reported respiratory symptoms as, as the initial symptom. Um, and we've got a couple graphs here that are pretty busy. So let me orient you. The y-axis on both of these is post-race blood sodium concentration. And along the x-axis is change in body mass. So this, this is the change from, from pre-race to post-race. So a negative value means that weight loss, or there's been weight loss. A positive value means there's been weight gain. And then in each one of these graphs, uh, I show um, the line for the lower limit of normal at 135, and then the upper limit uh, of uh, normal. And then um, in this case, a, a line distinguishing uh, between what we call modest or mild hyponatremia and uh, severe hyponatremia. So below uh, around one, 129. Each uh, dot here represents uh, a different individual at a, a specific event. Uh, these events up here on the top graph from Noakes and colleagues are um, marathons and Ironman triathlons and uh, various uh, ultra marathons. Uh, the dot or the graph here is all from 100 mile races from, from our data. Uh, the other thing uh, I want to point out here is the open circles are the symptomatic cases of hyponatremia. So what should be obvious is that all of these cases are um, uh, where there has been inadequate weight loss or weight gain. So in other words, you, you can probably develop hyponatremia without um, gaining weight or without, um, um, uh, yeah, without weight gain, but it's those that, that have weight gain or inadequate weight loss that tend to become symptomatic. 
And here, here's an example uh, of a specific individual. Um, so the, first off, these are data of the entire um, uh, runners in one year at Western States. Uh, again, this is a 100 mile running race. So we measured weight right um, uh, or during, during registration the day before the race, immediately before the start. And then we had them stop momentarily at, at each one of these points during the race and at the finish to get their weight on calibrated weight scales. The uh, solid lines represent the individuals that finish the dash lines those who did not finish. What you can see is it's pretty typical uh, for these people to be down about two to three percent in body weight. And in fact, that's, that's the amount of weight that they should lose because you, um, you lose fat stores, you lose water that's linked with glycogen stores. And so you, you do need to lose weight during prolonged exercise or else you're overhydrating. Here's what happened to one individual though. And um, this is how he left the race on, on a stretcher. He actually dropped out uh, around this point, uh, around 86 miles and hung out at that aid station for uh, about 30 minutes or so before he could get a ride back to the finish, which was about another 20 to 30 minute drive. And as they pulled up to near the finish line, he had a seizure. And um, fortunately, one of my colleagues uh, who, who was the race director that year happened to be um, coming into the stadium. He had been napping and um, coming back to the race and he walked right by this realized what was happening, actually recognized that one of the other medical staff was about to start an IV and uh, treat, treat this individual with hypotonic saline, hypotonic or isotonic, which is not the right treatment. He stopped that and he gave the individual the proper treatment and uh, he um, stopped seizing, uh, recovered, and then was transported to the hospital where he was mismanaged there, unfortunately. But, but he did uh, survive and he came back the next year and this is his weight profile that year. And he indeed was able to finish. Uh, we coached him about proper hydration uh, during that, that year <laughs> before he came back. So, What's going on uh, that causes people to develop this syndrome? Well, it's largely excessive water intake. So that's, that's the main stimulus. But there's something else going on. In, in general, if you drink too much water and, and it's not overly excessive beyond what, what your kidneys can, can uh, deal with, then you just urinate that, that water off. But if you're secreting a, a hormone, arginine vasopressin, or ant, it's also known as antidiuretic hormone, ADH, then you retain that water. And uh, so that is part of what's going on in this situation as, as well. And then there, there may be other factors. Some have thought that sodium loss in, in sweat contributes to the condition. Um, I, I think it's more likely that the inability to mobilize stored sodium is involved. Uh, we all have a lot of sodium stored in our body. It's stored in bone and connective tissue. And uh, when you um, need that sodium, assuming you haven't trained your body not to release that, then that becomes a, a source of sodium uh, to deal with these hyponatremic situations. Uh, there are a couple other hormones, ANP, which is atrial natriuretic uh, peptide and brain natriuretic peptide, BNP, uh, are also elevated in this condition. They help uh, retain water. 
And then um, there's this other phenomenon where we often see this period of lucency um, after someone finishes a race, for instance, and then about 30 minutes later, as in this case I, I described, the first presenting symptom may be a seizure. And the thought there is that there's been water retained in the GI system. And once they stop exercising, there's increased blood flow to the gut and then that water gets absorbed. And that sudden influx of that additional water is just enough to tip people over to where they start seizing. One more thing that I should mention, uh, some people have thought that taking in uh, inadequate sodium is an underlying cause, but we believe that taking in too much sodium can actually be a cause as well. In other words, if you take in too much sodium, you're stimulating your thirst drive even more. And in fact, that can occur even before there's an increase in blood osmolality. There are osmoreceptors in the gut that will uh, stimulate thirst even before the blood level changes. So that, that's probably involved here as well. Um, so I, I mentioned the arginine vasopressin being part of the issue. Um, we have to question why, why would that hormone be secreted? Because normally it would be suppressed under conditions of hyponatremia. But um, there are various non-osmotic stimuli for the secretion of this hormone. And they include the, the list here. And in fact, uh, if you've ever run an ultra marathon, you would know that um, many of these things on this list are, are just part of the experience of running, uh, say, a 100-mile race. So nausea, um, the exercise itself, the thermal stress, pain, rhabdomyolysis. Uh, in the case of uh, some of these races, like Western states, there's also, or, um, there's also high altitude involved. So there's a good reason that the, this hormone would be secreted. <laughs> so how do we make the diagnosis? Well, these are the typical symptoms for exercise-associated hyponatremic encephalopathy. So uh, you can have fatigue, um, um, various um, um, other nonspecific um, findings, uh, certainly nausea is, is typical. And then we get into the CNS symptoms that, that are common, uh, um, dizziness, confusion, uh, eventually that can progress to uh, seizure and coma. And then I, I had mentioned the respiratory distress that, that can occur in some situations. I've got urine output here. Uh, this is important. Um, typically, uh, early on, there is lack of urine production. And that's, again, because of the secretion of arginine vasopressin. Uh, that can be confusing. Uh, if you're exercising on a hot day and you're not producing urine, it's not uncommon for people to think, well, I'm getting dehydrated and I need to drink more. And if that lack of urine production is there because of hyponatremia, then you're just making matters worse. Now, at, at some point as we self-correct or recover from this condition, then there's a massive diuresis or, or urinary output. So that, that's why I've got that here as well. The trouble is that a lot of these symptoms are, are pretty nonspecific. And in fact, if you look at how they compare with exertional heat stress and with altitude illness, you, you can see that there's tremendous overlap. So 
one thing you, you certainly have to do is try to get a decent history about fluid intake. And that will help, help uh, um, you figure out if, if you might be dealing with hyponatremia. And then ideally, um, you'll get a blood sample and run um, uh, a point of care analysis of, of sodium. That's what's being done here. Um, and this actually is not a situation where uh, this individual, wh where we had concern about him being hyponatremia. This is part of a research study, but this guy actually did have a serious case of hyponatremia uh, in the past associated with an Iron, Ironman triathlon. He was hospitalized a number of days. So ideally getting a blood sample, but uh, generally speaking, you can't do that in the field. So trying to get a history and if it seems like the individual's actually been overhydrating, then hyponatremia should be high on your uh, diagnostic list. So how do we treat this? Well, um, some of our first information about how best to treat this came from this, this study that was published in JAMA 1986. It was from the 1983 American Medical Joggers Association Ultramarathon, which was a 50 mile and 100 kilometer ultramarathons. Um, I, I actually ran my first ultramarathon in 1984. So it was a year after these two cases. And uh, there was discussion uh, about proper hydration <laughs> uh, during the pre-race briefing and they had changed their guidelines. Uh, in 1983, they were recommending that people drink uh, uh, this much, which, which amounted to um, almost 20 liters in the 50 mile race and over 20 liters in, in the 100 kilometer race. So quite a lot of fluids. Um, and uh, because these individuals were, were drinking that way, uh, shortly after they finished the race, uh, they both became symptomatic. Interestingly, one was a medical student and the other was a licensed physician. Uh, the medical student ended up having a blood sodium of 123 and the licensed physician 118. Uh, and they, they were both fine shortly or for, for a short period of time after finishing and then, then uh, developed severe um, central nervous system uh, symptoms. They were, uh, for some reason, unknown reason, they were transported to different hospitals. The uh, medical student went to a hospital where he was treated with IV normal saline. And the licensed physician uh, was treated with IV hypertonic saline, 3% saline. And uh, the medical student ended up having seizures. He was semi-comatose for, for a day and a half and was hospitalized for five days. Um, the other guy, fully alert in three hours, discharged from the emergency department after eight hours. Uh, so th this is sort of some of our, our first decent evidence about how, how you would treat this condition. You, you definitely don't wanna treat it with hypotonic or isotonic fluids. And uh, we now know that treating it with hypertonic solution along with, um, fluid restriction is the proper way to, to treat this. Uh, and indeed, if, if you want some evidence, here, here's a graph from a, a different study that showed change in, in serum sodium over time after uh, normal saline, uh, which is 0.19% saline was given. Um, you know, the typical, um, Par group of paramedics or emergency department, uh, anyone comes in, they start an IV and they start giving them uh, isotonic or hypotonic fluids, particularly if they've been exercising and there's a thought that they might be dehydrated. Um, 
in general, treating people that way is, is not going to do harm. But if someone is, has congestive heart failure or hyponatremia, it can indeed do harm. And so you need to uh, distinguish those. Uh, so how does this hypertonic saline work? Well, first off, we, we generally recommend uh, using a bolus of about 100 mils of 3% hypertonic saline, and it can be repeated three or four times. And in fact, there, there have been some reports where it's been repeated beyond that and uh, because it's been necessary and uh, it's, it's been appropriate. So what, uh, what this amount of sodium load does it, is it will increase blood sodium one or two millimoles per liter for each 100 mil bolus. Um, that also causes a volume expansion and that helps shut down the secretion of arginine vasopressin. And so once, once that occurs, uh, then you have an aquaresis or, or you, you produce urine and uh, your blood sodium increases further. So all of those things feed back to increased blood sodium. And I, I've added this on, on the schematic to remind me uh, to talk about um, central pontine myelinolysis. So th this is a problem that occurs when someone has developed chronic hyponatremia. So over the course of days, weeks, months, they've developed hyponatremia. In those circumstances, there are certain cells in the brain that adapt to that chronic hyponatremia. And organic osmolites that are within the cells are excreted. If you treat people with chronic hyponatremia aggressively, then you can do damage to those brain cells. That's not the case for acute hyponatremia. And in fact, there's, there's been no cases of this uh, brain injury from treating acute hyponatremia aggressively with the hypertonic saline. So that is not an excuse for um, not using hypertonic saline. Uh, we've done some st studies um, looking at the effectiveness of hypertonic saline and oral um, hypertonic saline, so IV and oral. This was a study uh, one year among uh, a group of runners at, at the finish line of Western states that were hyponatremic. They were not symptomatic, but they were hyponatremic. We randomized them uh, between oral and IV. And you, you can see that the increase in blood sodium was identical between these two groups. So if, if someone is alert enough and it's safe for them to take in oral hypertonic saline, that can be just as effective as giving it to them IV. However, if they've had a seizure or if they're obtunded, you're not going to be able to use that approach. Uh, and this is the solution that I uh, mix up. So basically a half teaspoon of uh, regular table salt, throw in some crystal light for flavoring. And I mix up um, a few packets of, of this, put it in a small Ziploc bag. Um, I, I have a pretty good idea where 100 cc's will be on that bag. And uh, so if I'm out in the field, uh, I can add some water to the fill line uh, on that bag, mix it up, and then have the individual take it. It's quite easy uh, as an easy approach if you think someone might be hyponatremic. Um, and uh, easy to carry that uh, with you in the field. So most importantly, how do we prevent this? Um, so I showed you these graphs before the symptomatic cases. Well, obviously don't overhydrate. That's, <laughs> that's the easiest way to prevent this. And you 
uh, should not be striving to maintain body weight during exercise. You should anticipate losing some, some body weight, particularly if it's prolonged exercise. Uh, and the other thing is don't pay attention to these companies that can profit uh, by uh, your overhydration. And, and indeed, this has been a big source of, of the problem of, of why we have seen so much hyponatremia, particularly in the US, uh, where these companies have, have been quite aggressive with their marketing. Uh, we, we've actually seen less incidents of hyponatremia in other countries like South Africa and Australia, even in Europe where the marketing has not been allowed to be quite so aggressive. So um, it's not hydrate or die, it's actually overhydrate and die. Um, and the big question is why do athletes do this? Well, it's partly because of all this marketing and they've convinced uh, athletes that uh, they need to maintain their body mass during exercise or else it will impair performance. Um, certainly, if you're exercising an hour, um, you don't need to worry about uh, that you need to lose a lot of mass. <laughs> On the other hand, you can exercise an hour no matter how hot it is without taking in any fluids and you're not going to lose a serious amount of, of body mass, uh, assuming you started out adequately hydrated. Um, there's also been this push that drinking to thirst is inadequate. So you need to drink to some sort of schedule. And oftentimes that schedule is determined by calculating how much uh, mass you lose during, during uh, a, a workout and doing the calculation to determine your sweat rate. Uh, that's, that's wrong. First off, because you, you shouldn't be keeping your weight stable. You should be losing some weight. And uh, sweat rate varies tremendously depending upon the circumstances. So if, if the temperature varies, then sweat rate will vary. Your sweat rate is also not stable within the individual. It depends on their state of training and their hydration state. So uh, there are a lot of... Uh, ways that uh, drinking to some sort of schedule uh, can cause problems. On the other hand, um, we've, we've adapted quite well and we have this mechanism of thirst that is very good at telling us when we need to take in fluids. And so if people simply listen to their bodies uh, under most circumstances, um, if they drink to thirst, they'll be just fine. Uh, I already mentioned this business with uh, reduced urine output or concentrated urine and the presumption that you're dehydrated, dehydrated so you need to take in more fluid. Uh, that's not the case if you're developing hyponatremia. Uh, and then this, these myths that mild dehydration impairs performance, causes muscle cramping and increases the risk of heat illness. Uh, these amount to another couple hours worth of lecture, but, but I can tell you that uh, those, those are not accurate. Um, but those are all reasons that we've seen athletes overhydrate. So uh, to prevent this, well, uh, you want to prevent overhydration, and that's easily done by just drinking the thirst. Uh, we also should probably avoid excessive sodium supplementation, um, which is actually, that's actually been very common in endurance and ultra endurance events. Um, monitoring body weight can be useful, certainly in some very long events. Uh, it's not unusual to stop athletes and have them weigh in, uh, but keep in mind that weight loss should be expected. And then uh, we, uh, over, over the last decade plus, we've been 
trying to do our best about educating athletes, event volunteers, and medical personnel. And um, that seemed to have made some, uh, some difference in this as well. Uh, so the key points about the educational part here, EAH can kill, consider it in, in your differential. If someone goes down, uh, you treat it with fluid restriction and hypertonic saline. Uh, you prevent it by avoiding overhydration and uh, drink uh, responsibly, drink to thirst. Um, and if you see this guy out on the trail, um, I'd be worried about him developing hyponatremia. So uh, if there's any questions about that, I can take, take questions now on this. And then I want to spend a few minutes about with, with what you actually are probably most interested in. Yeah, so Dr. Hoffman, a few of our participants submitted questions beforehand um, and throughout this talk. So um, I can ask you sort of a combination of what a few people were asking, which is what do you recommend people supplement with? Um, and I think we can break this down into what do you recommend for like shorter events like the marathon? Um, and longer events that are like multi-day. Um, do you recommend like fluid combinations sort of like you made with the salt water and like crystal light or do you recommend water and foods or like salt packets? Um, yeah. So yeah, so, what are your um, uh, suggestions? Yeah, yeah, the, so those are all good questions. So um, if, if we don't think about the energy component of this and just think about the hydration component if, if you're exercising an hour, you don't need to do anything. Uh, you will adequately hydrate and replace sodium uh, between the end of that exercise bout and your next bout probably the next day or, or whatever. So no, there should be no concern there. If we're talking about something like a marathon, then indeed you need to take in fluids and I would drink to thirst. You, you don't, there's no reason to drink to any specific schedule. Just drinking to thirst um, is, is going to be adequate. And I can tell you, I've, I've run marathons, multiple marathons without taking in any fluids. Uh, some of those were back in the days before we actually realized that you, you could put water in, in a water bottle. You know, back in the 70s, I don't, I don't know why no one thought of putting water in a water bottle. Uh, Everyone just put the cups out on the table and you would grab the cup and you would then splash it on your face and your chest and maybe get a drizzle in your mouth. And so that was back in the day when I was running fast enough that it, it was a potential hindrance to actually slow down to drink. So I, I would run marathons when it was cool without any fluids. So I know, I know it can be done. Uh, but ideally, you're, you're going to take in some fluids during a, an event that lasts a few hours. Um, probably no need for sodium supplementation at all uh, during events of that duration. And then when we get into events of 8 to 30 hours or multiple days, then we're talking about a need for um, uh, uh, some sodium uh, intake, and in general, that for for the multi-day things, that can certainly be done in food, and probably even in say a twenty to thirty hour event, just taking in foods that that tend to have a lot of sodium is is all you need, and again, drinking to thirst is is the answer. Um, your body, if, if you listen to it, it, it sends you signals. And I can tell you that many people in these ultra marathons are, are craving uh, salty food-like items. Uh, pretzels, um, soup goes, goes down really well. You know, the salty uh, broth, uh, chicken noodle soup, that sort of thing with, with loads of sodium in it. Uh, that's what, what you tend to crave. And that's probably because you need a little sodium uh, at that point. So 
just mostly listen to what your body's telling you. You don't need to spend a lot of money on fancy products uh, for the most part. Awesome, thank you so much. And we have like several other questions coming in, um, but I know you said you had one other thing you wanted to share with us. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, let's see if, yeah, so I, my presumption was that you wanted some information about how, um, how I got into overlapping and, and maybe more than overlapping with wilderness medicine. And so I, this was sort of an interesting exercise for me to, to go through. Um, certainly, you know, it, it started with my history of running and from that an interest in health and exercise science and, and also the development of a foot injury that got me to the point where I got to know a podiatrist who encouraged me to, to leave engineering and uh, pursue medicine. So that was sort of the start. And then uh, in medical school, during my first year of medical school, I, I knew that I was interested in exercise science and there, there happened to be a rotation uh, a research rotation. So I took that and that led to uh, me actually developing a, a really nice relationship with the physiology department and uh, the chair of the department and actually doing my own study the summer after my first year of medical school. And I, I'd have to say that the involvement with that lab and my own research and, and the research of others uh, during medical school is, is a big part of what kept me sane. Um, not only that, but uh, I was I went to medical school in St. Louis in, at St. Louis University, and where it gets very hot in the summer, and because I had a laboratory key, uh, and I did not have air conditioning where I lived, I, I actually was able to sleep in the laboratory <laughs> with air conditioning. So that, that was a nice plus. Um, because of my interest in exercise and musculoskeletal medicine and sports medicine, I, I chose a residency in PMNR. Uh, that was, seemed to be the best fit for me at the time. And early on in that residency, I, I got to know uh, an individual who had a spinal cord injury. This was someone that, that actually came uh, and visited with new spinal cord injured individuals to, to help them cope with, with this process. And he, he was an athlete. And uh, so he got me interested in the exercise related uh, to spinal cord injury. And so while I was still in residency, I, I published a review paper Actually, um, still, this paper is still cited more than any other paper I've published at this point. And uh, from that, I, I started doing some SCI uh, exercise related research. Uh, but then I, and, and that would have been a, a good track to pursue, but I got distracted by uh, cross country skiing. Uh, which is something I started doing. And at that time, uh, it was when the new, um, new at the time skating technique was being developed. And there was no science on that. And so I actually started doing the science uh, related to this technique. And we, we published uh, the bulk of the, the early research related to this. And from that, um, uh, I was recruited to be a researcher with U.S. Biathlon uh, skiing and shooting. I didn't know anything about the shooting part, but um, they asked me to, to help out with their research. And once they figured out I was a physician, then I also helped out with the medical stuff. Um, my clinical interest had, had largely been sports medicine, and I had also started uh, my career with the VA in the cardiac rehab department at the VA. 
but I wanted to start a musculoskeletal clinic at the VA at, at this one point. And it happened to be within the pain management area. And um, once, once I started interacting with those folks, uh, I, I got more interested in pain management. And to be honest, I was finding sports medicine a little boring because it's, it's, it's relatively easy. Uh, most athletes end up getting better. Uh, and so I went to the other extreme uh, where most patients don't <laughs> get better, unfortunately. Uh, but that, that got me interested in pain related research. And so I, I did a number of studies looking at the acute effect of exercise on pain perception. Um, I moved to California in 2003 and um, I had uh, certainly known about this, this race called the Western States Endurance Run and um, started interacting with people uh, that um, were involved in the race and um, uh, started, I, I shifted back from cross country skiing to ultra marathon running at the same time. And we ended up doing a pain related study at Western States in 2005. And there were some other studies taking place at the race that year. And it was my observation that things were sort of out of control. For instance, one of the research team actually had a whiteboard, a big whiteboard in the registration area where they had written the name and the phone number and the address of every participant in, that had signed up for their study. Well, that, that's a big no-no in human research. You, you wanna protect people's uh, confidentiality. You, you don't do that sort of thing. So I, uh, after the race that year, I politely mentioned it to the race director and said, look, you, you, you know, you're at risk here. You probably need some, some control over this. And um, as is common, if, if you bring up an issue, then, then you get recruited to, to solve the problem. And so I uh, was appointed as the research director and with the task of developing a formal research program at this race. And it evolved into uh, a big program uh, where we actually served as a funding organization to support research and had a, a full formal application process and, and all of that. And, and there was indeed a lot of research that got accomplished because of that. Along the lines, there was this incident um, at the 2006 Western States that was the video I showed you. And that, that uh, spurred the interest in the uh, hyponatremia related research and hydration research. And that, that we actually did our first study in 2008 and that's, that's continued for, for quite a while. Um, along the way, um, because of my involvement in, in the research and in running these races, um, I got more involved in medical coverage. And um, from that, we developed a, a medicine and science conference and a, a formal foundation that uh, serves to promote uh, education and uh, support research. Uh, so there, there were some overlaps with wilderness medicine there, particularly as related to hydration and hyponatremia in the wilderness. Uh, but, um, and, and I guess you could say the ultra endurance medicine, which most of these races are, are actually on trails out in the wilderness. So it is uh, to some uh, degree practicing medicine in, in an environment where the, the resources are limited, which is basically how you define wilderness medicine. Uh, and then I, of course, I, I ha have always had inter personal interest in being in the mountains and all that. And uh, 
So that, that uh, stimulated my involvement with our local search and rescue and uh, developing some ultralight uh, wilderness gear as well. So that in a nutshell, that gives you a little background about my pathway. My advice to you would be uh, to find what you're passionate about. Um, some of you know what that is now. Some of you may still be searching a bit, but you know, try to find what that is. Uh, try to do what you can to figure out what's realistic. For instance, if, if you want to strictly do wilderness medicine, you might be able to do that, but you probably won't be wealthy if that's all you do, you know, just recognizing what, what is the reality here. Uh, once you figure that out, then pursue your passion. Expect diversions along the way, like, like I've had, uh, and be open to finding your passion in unexpected ways. For instance, I, I ended up spending 35 years with the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, I never once imagined when, when I started um, that, that position uh, as a fresh faculty member that, that I would stay with the VA. The VA was the place largely that um, um, you, you went if, if you were lazy or if you were incredibly academic. Um, and it, it actually turned out well for me because I, I hope you figured out that I, I tend to be on the academic rather than the lazy side. Um, so anyway, uh, and then uh, if all that uh, happens, I think you'll live a fulfilling life. So um, there's my email address if you wanna ask any questions later, but I, I have time for any questions now. Yay. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Dr. Hoffman. That was a awesome talk. I know there's a lot of runners here um, today that are also medical students. So I know that that was incredibly relevant we had a bunch of people say that they're running Ironman super soon. So I know what you said was super relevant, but thank you so much for your time. I know we're about 10 minutes over. So for those of you that have to leave, I understand, but Dr. Hoffman said he could stay. If anybody has any burning questions, feel free to go ahead and turn your videos on and ask and Emily can help with that as well. But otherwise, thank you for coming so much. And thank you again, Dr. Hoffman. You're welcome. I actually yeah, have I'll... one quick question. Um, go for that's it. okay. So hi, thank you so much for hi. your talk. Um, that was super interesting. And I, I remember you mentioned that there have been guidelines established or rather the book has been edited, um, the like, little pocket guide that um, the person you spoke about used in order to treat the person that he was uh, dealing with um, incorrectly treat. But my question is actually, is has there been any um, published guideline for runners specifically in terms of like essentially everything you've discussed? The research that you found that says you know don't overhydrate don't take in too much sodium because these are the results that we found i'm just curious if there's, if there's anything that's been laid out yeah so so if you're asking about um something that um is is more directed towards the um the lay population you you can go to our foundation website i'm just pulling it up here to um so i can give you the so yeah, and I'm actually really, wondering about ultra marathon specifically. Yeah, well, th this applies uh, to, to both, but okay. if, if you go to our website, it's uessm.org. Uh, so ultra endurance sports science and medicine is what the acronym stands for. Mm -hmm. Uessm.org. And then uh, under education and then uh, there's a link under that, Athlete Education. And uh, the first article there is the basics of proper hydration during prolonged exercise. Okay. So that, that would be um, one, one place. Um, uh, and it, it was written by me, so I, I know it was accurate. Okay. Thank you so much.
Yeah, if anybody else has questions, feel free to speak up. Otherwise, I've got a list of some that people asked us and I can share it next. I put it in the chat, but um, since I don't know if you're even collaborating with the VA in, in New Mexico at all, I don't think they're doing any of that sort of research, but I know UNM uh, Mountain Medicine Program through their med school, they're doing some special forces research up at Taos Ski Valley. Well, they had planned to prior to COVID, but I was just kind of wondering if you were going to be involved in that. Um, so it's really, they do research at Grand Canyon and stuff for all of their diploma students and stuff too. Uh, that's mostly about hyponatremia and such. So they're kind of in that same arena you're in. And so I just wonder if you were gonna be collaborating with them on any research so I could uh, meet you. Yeah, so, so when, um, were you referring to University of New Mexico? Yes. Yeah, okay, okay. So, um, yeah, long story there, I'll try to keep it really short. Um, the um, paramedic uh, at Grand Canyon several years ago that, um, that uh, was interested in this topic, along with the former medical director of Grand Canyon, uh, I got to know them and uh, I was uh, asked to help develop uh, uh, some studies there. And uh, I don't, I, I contributed to the design of the study and then uh, I was sort of never really um, kept in the loop thereafter. So I, I'm not quite sure okay. what, what happened, um, but I do know that that individual, uh, the paramedic ended up going to medical school at, uh, in New Mexico and collaborating further with that group. So. I, my presumption is she figured she she didn't no longer needed me. Uh, uh, that she, she needed them to get get her route into medical school and uh, didn't need me. So it's a cool pro that that mountain medicine program is cool. It, like yeah, if you ever get a good. chance to collaborate with them. Um, you know the like so many like like every area in science. It, it's um, I think. If, if you, I, I think for some people, it's easy to read a few papers and think that they're an expert in a topic and then they can go off and, and do these sort of studies. And um, generally I would not suggest taking that route. <laughs> I, I would suggest if, if you find a, an area you're passionate about, making, sh making sure you've seek out the experts in that field and trying to get the opportunity to collaborate with them on existing work so that you develop the foundation that you need to eventually do your own. And along the way, you may find out that there's something else that's actually more interesting uh, that's, that might be relevant, but um, you know, it, the, the only way to fully understand a topic is to be doing the research in that topic. Uh, you're always at least two or three years of, ahead of everyone else, even if they've read everything that's been published. And not only do you know what, what you've got going on and what may be in the works in terms of your, your own data collection, but then you become a reviewer that's sought after to review um, manuscripts submitted on that same topic. So you suddenly become aware of everything else that's being done on that, that topic. So, you know, try to be humble, you know, early on uh, as you're developing your expertise um, and, um, it, it will pay off in, in the end. Great. Thank you. All right. So I think we're about 15 minutes over. Um, I just don't want to keep you any longer, Dr. Hoffman, because you've been so gracious with your time and everybody else. Thank you for coming so much. I really appreciate it. I hope to see you guys at some of my future talks. Dr. Hoffman, this is amazing. 
We do have a couple more questions, but we'll just end up emailing them to you so we can get the answers that they're looking for. Um, but otherwise, everyone have a great rest of your evening. And thank you so much. That was awesome. Bye. Bye.